So born into the royal family, your rights never expire. You are forever known as members of the monarchy with the keys to immense wealth, worldwide recognition, lifetime celebrity status, and so much more. Well, remarkably, and with very little historical precedence, two years ago, two members of the royal family of Britain actually stepped down as senior royal members. They no longer represent the queen, and they're now completely financially independent of the royal family and the royal wealth, with a few other privileges that they lose. They wanted to chart their own path. They want to create their own separate line. Yes, the royal life, it does have immense privileges, but it comes with equally burdensome consequences. And for them, the pressure was way too intense, and there's way too much family tension. They've left, yes, but actually they technically they can come back, presuming the family and, and prince wants them back. And I think sometimes we, we think similarly of God's kingdom. By faith, we share in all the promises that Christ has given to us, and he has. And we think, yeah, we're, we're in this royal family. We're in this kingdom. But sometimes we think, I can do better. I think I can, I, I can create my own promise. I can, I can do this family better. This family, this, this royal family, this is way too messy. It, it's not what I had pictured. I, I'd like to control my future. I'd like to chart my own path, which moves us to the end of Galatians 4. Paul asks, are you sure? Let me tell you about the line you come from and all the privileges you have, you could never experience on your own. Because Paul, as he has just said, you already share these privileges. These are already yours. And it can be too easy to fall back into the systems of the world, the things we think we can control. We've been purchased, we've been redeemed, but sweating and working for this, something that we feel like we earned, it can be way too tempting. So Paul actually brings your status up front, your status as these royal citizens, as these, these, the seed of the kingdom. You are, you are no longer citizens, as Galatians 4 talks of this earthly Jerusalem, of this earthly kingdom. You're citizens right now of a heavenly kingdom. And you'll hear this as Paul brings it out in these three points. First, to see in your outline, is the temptation to leave, verses 15 to 20. We know the truth, you know the truth. But sometimes the temptation to leave this, to kind of chart our own path, it's really strong. And then point two is the promised seed. So verses 21 through 27. You are already citizens of the kingdom from above. And we come from the kingdom from below. We come from this earthly kingdom. And then point three, the freedom you need. So verses 28 to 31. This heavenly kingship is not something we think of and think this is coming later on. And I can't wait to actually participate in this. But this heavenly kingdom you're already citizens of, it actually, it actually drives you through temptation, drives you through trials, drives you through hardships. It doesn't drive you around it. So in Christ, I hope you hear this. In Christ, you can truly experience your heavenly citizenship as a child of the promise, even through trial and temptation. And this is especially important as the Galatians hear this, as they're being tempted, as they have trials, when we are tempted to leave. Like this, this is getting kind of hard. This earthly kingdom doesn't like the heavenly kingdom, and we're feeling it. This brings us to our first point, the temptation to leave. Paul bridges his thoughts from verses 1 through 40 to verse 15 by asking you kind of a simple question, but actually launches us into a warning. It says in verse 15, do you know that you are blessed? 
that you actually have a blessing. This blessing is already yours. So he just finished reminding the Galatians of their royal inheritance. You already are blessed. This is, this is already yours. You, you received the spirit that actually gave you, already gave you all the promise. Every right as an heir of God through Christ. Because formally, as he says, the Galatians would have literally gouged out their eyes and given them to him. It's, it's probably a sign of extreme affection. We'll even give you our eyes. That's how much we love you. And notice through the same eyes that at the beginning of chapter 3 saw Christ in his work through the preaching of Paul. We'll give it right back to him. We saw Christ through our eyes in your preaching. We'll give it right back to you. That's how much we love you. And so he asks much the same question he asked in Romans 4 surrounding the promise of Abraham. Or you could say the blessing of Abraham. Don't you know you're already blessed? You already have this. So he turns back around to verse 16, asking in effect, I've preached to you the good news of Jesus, and, and now you think I'm your enemy. Now you think I'm against you. Why is this? Those, those who've come to convince the Galatians that you can add from the law to the gospel, it's, it's become really appealing. I can, I can do something about this. I can do something on my own. So much so that the Galatians start wondering about Paul. Is the, is the gospel actually really good news? What you've been telling us, this is not what I'm hearing from other people. Is this actually good news? So Paul, in response, probably gives the best plan words in the Greek of any verse of Galatians. Because to shut you out in verse 17 is the same verbal form as church in Greek. So, you know, church comes the word to, to call out. And if you use that little first part, it's just to shut you out. So it says, instead of being called out ones, the church, which is where this comes from, those who desire to bring back the law are trying to shut you out. They're not calling you out of the church. They're trying to push you out of the church. So he's using this play on words. They, you think they're doing this, but what they're really doing is they're trying to push you out. They, they want to take you out of this covenant community. They want to take you out of this church. By placing you, not just out and kind of on your own, but actually by placing you in the law. By placing you in the old covenants. And so he rebukes them. So it, it is always good to be made of much for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you. As if to say, you Galatians, kind of does too, you're really only zealous for the gospel when I'm with you. When I have my presence around you, then, then you want to do stuff. But when I'm gone, you begin wondering if they're right. So you're really only kind of zealous when I'm around you. Just like the Galatians, I think we can tend to take on the characteristics of those we admire. We're, we're zealous around those who are zealous and not zealous around those who are not zealous. They seemingly admired the Galatians. They kind of whoever was stopped by last. It's, that was kind of freshest in their memory. They were zealous for this, now we're zealous for this. And I think we can do the same thing. They, they hitched the Galatians, they, they're their religious convictions on Paul's coattails, kind of whatever he believed, which is good, is what they believe. It was really his fervor that they kind of mistook as their own. Only fighting for truth when Paul is around. It's almost like saying, well, Paul's here, better start fighting now. Well, when Paul's here, we're going to have to do our own thing. I think if we're around, quote unquote, like good Christian people, we tend to be courageous and strong. Like, you were going to fight. But if around those who don't share our convictions, and maybe they're entirely antagonistic to the faith, we tend, we tend not to be. We tend to be a little bit low. Should it be, should not be though, around those who actually don't share our convictions, that we're strongest, that we're clearest. 
I'm not saying we have to be unnecessarily confrontational, which is, I think, bad. But stand on truth. We have to be winsome and loving. But we should stand on it. So, so like a, a loving mother, in a sense, Paul responds, he's at pains to produce fruit of Christ in them. He's, he's been doing this all throughout his letter, and he's probably again pulling from Isaiah. Isaiah 51, 2. We read this a few weeks ago. And it's significant he pulls from Isaiah 51 here. Because he uses this word again later on. It's actually foreshadowing pains that Sarah has. Sarah couldn't have a kid, and she was at pains to have a kid. She wanted to extend her line. God had promised it to her at 75, and she's like, there's, there's no way. There's no way I can do this stuff. And Paul describes he has these same birth pains for the Galatians, for us. Before he does so, though, he's, he's perplexed. He's, he's not sure what to do. How do I do this? It's not dissimilar to how we can respond ourselves if, if we're pulled away from the truth. You think, I know the gospel, but this, why is this so appealing to me? Why am, I, why am I being persuaded by this? Why am I following this? And when he says, change my tone, it's not like, I'm going to get a lot more stern with you. I'm going to get a lot more frustrated with you. I'm going to really show you how I feel about what you're doing. I'm going to let you have it. I'm going to change my tone and let you have it. It's actually like New Covenant context. It's used five times outside of this New Testament. And it's actually him saying, I'm going to present future glories to you. I'm going to show you what the gospel is. This is, this is the way I'm going to change my tone. I'm actually going to show you gospel stuff. And that's exactly what Paul does in verse 21. We move to point two, the promised seed. So he starts this by asking a, a really simple and yet a profound question. He asks, tell me, you, talking to Galatians, talking to us, you who desire to be under the law, or he's just talked about this all throughout Galatians 3, you're under the law in Galatians 4, you're under the law or you're under Christ. Do you not listen to the law? You really want to be under this. Have you never heard what it requires of you? So to produce this gospel fruit that Paul wants to produce in us, he starts with the law. He's like, you're not going to get the glories of the gospel if you don't get the burden of the law. So he's not telling them of their obligation to the law. He's saying, this is what you've been saved from. Have you heard the thing that you've been saved from? Because sometimes, just like us, we, we need to hear fresh our sins, condemns what our sins have done to us, what our sins have done to separate us from God. So we can hear afresh what our Savior has done for us. And Paul's kind of doing that here. He's, he's bringing back the law. He's like, this is the law. This is what you've been saved from. And it's also introducing us what he says later on. It's Everything he says from verses 22 to 31 is basically the law. That's what you've been saved from. It's really a summary. And then he gets into the gospel. In verse 22, amazingly enough, he starts with Abraham. This exact verse, though, is actually not in the Abraham narrative. When he says, it is written, it's actually not in, it's not, it's not in Genesis. So the exact verse is not found from one place. It actually pulls from two places. It pulls from Genesis 16 and 21. 16 is the birth of Ishmael from Hagar. That's the according to the flesh. And Genesis 21 is the birth of Isaac from Sarah. This is the through the promise. And there's something remarkable about this. And I think we read over this way too quickly. Think of where Genesis 16 and 21 fall. They're both after the covenants given to Abraham from the Lord. He sins in Genesis 16. He takes Hagar, Sarah gives him Hagar, immediately following the covenant given to him in Genesis 15. 
when the Lord promises Abraham that he will fulfill everything he has promised. That right in Genesis 16, is like, I think I can do it better. I think I can take Hagar. Sarah gives me Hagar. Kind of taking on Adam and Eve again. Eve gives him the fruit to Adam and says, hey, this is good. I think we can do this on our own. Adam's like, sure, let's do it. Abraham does the same thing. He's like, sure, I think we can make our own promise. It was his very sin. Taking another wife. He's got two wives in Genesis 16. He's, he's already got Sarah. It's not like he moves from Hagar to Sarah later. He's already got Sarah and he takes on Hagar. So right after the covenant's given to him in Genesis 15, he sins in Genesis 16. But it doesn't nullify the promise. God doesn't say, well, you messed up. Sorry. Not giving you any more. And Paul uses this now to confirm God's promise. Because in no way is it leveled on Abraham's obedience. He's not like, Abraham, you got to do this. Because if, it, if it's on Abraham, this covenant's not keeping. This covenant's not staying on. Nor is Sarah's kind of act lifted up as an example for us. Because she gives Abraham Hagar. Say, hey, let's, let's do this on our own. It all relates and it all revolves around God's faithfulness to us. So I can ask a question for you. Have you failed? You know God's promise. You know God's word. Have you fallen? As, as Paul is promising the Galatians, as God promises Abraham, if you trust in Christ, it is not your performance. It is God's faithfulness. So Paul continues in verse 23 to explain who was born according to what purpose. Ishmael was Abraham's attempts to bring about God's promise. And Isaac was God's. Isaac, as, as the original says, was born literally according to the gospel. It's the same word we get from the gospel. For Sarah, it was an age that nothing can be born. If you're 75, you're not bearing a child. It's, it's a barren womb. It's, it's not something that's going to do anything. So for some kid to come out of her womb, that's, I mean, that's a miracle. It's, it's almost like a virgin bearing a child. And then a passage that has confused many, for Paul now says he's speaking allegorically. And they're like, hold up. If you're using our definition for allegory, you're just kind of pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Something that's not actually there. He's kind of bringing something out of nowhere. And he's, not, he's not pulling meaning from this that wouldn't have already been there. He's, he's using allegory to say this is a historical event, historical situation, and I'm applying it to the present. And I can do this because of Christ. That, that's his kind of definition of an allegory. Historical events that we can apply to the present because of Christ. So he's not bypassing anything. He's, he's actually telling the Galatians and to you, contemporary believers, through the perspective of historical narrative. It still has bearing for us today. That's, that's how he's kind of bringing, that's how ancient authors thought of allegories. It's historical narrative that still has precedence for today. So he says, these two women present two covenants. The first Hagar is Mount Sinai. What happens at Mount Sinai? giving of the Ten Commandments. It's the written law, actually codified written law that they see. You notice this, is, this births slavery. That's why the, the people hearing the law, upon hearing the law, in Exodus 24, right after they get the Ten Commandments, they said, we'll do this. We'll do all of it. So they actually, they willingly subject themselves to the law. They actually could have said no. I think this is too hard. But they willingly subjected themselves to the law. We can do this. That's, that's what births slavery. They said, yeah, I can obey. Much as the Judaizers are coaxing the Galatians to do. They're like, hey, you can do this. If we had circumcision, maybe a few things from the law, I think you can separate yourselves. 
So the Israelite generations to follow from Sinai actually born into this. The decision that people make in Exodus 24 to say, yes, we can do this. Everybody after that is given the same commandment. Okay? They said this. Now you have to do it. And so Hagar and their attempt to bring the promise on their own. Again, Sarah brings Hagar to Abraham. He says, okay, let's do this. It's compared to an earthly Jerusalem. Mount Sinai and the law is compared with a temple in Jerusalem. That's where the temple is at right now. It's in the middle of Jerusalem. And so this by now is, was actually no longer where worship happened. It's destroyed a few years later. It will become known as man's attempts through the temple to be right with God. They thought, as long as we do this stuff, God will be okay with us. But remember what happens in the gospel. What does Jesus do with the temple in Jerusalem? He throws tables. He curses the temple. And still they think, yeah, through this, I can be made right with God. The temple, actually the true Jerusalem, the true temple, <coughs> the perfect Israel, God's own son, has done it. He's now the temple. John 1, 14, John 1, 12, talk about this. He templed, he tabernacled among, among us. He's the temple. Why, why, do we, why do the Galatians feel the need to observe this stuff towards righteousness? Why do they think that sacrificing is what gives them God's pleasure when the sacrifice has been made? Which is why in verse 26, Paul can say, the above Jerusalem, that's free. The heavenly Jerusalem, she's our mother. So your inheritance, your status before God doesn't come from your doing. It doesn't come from, I'm going to try to bring this up myself. I'm going to try to make myself right. It doesn't come from what you bring to the table. It comes from God's own promise that you couldn't. So he inserts you into the kingdom from above. You remember John 3. What does Jesus say to Nicodemus in John 3? You must be born again or born from above. Paul is saying the same thing in Galatians 4. There's this heavenly Jerusalem. If you're born of that heavenly Jerusalem, if you're born from above, you're a son of God. So Paul concludes this allegory with a quote from Isaiah 54. Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be no more than those, will be more than one who has a husband. And what's remarkable about, the, what's remarkable about this verse is twofold. First, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a clear allusion to Sarah. Her barrenness. Basically, all women's barrenness after Sarah is modeled after Sarah in the Bible. And her overwhelming desire, she laughs when the Spirit says, you'll bear a child. Because that's, that's all she wants. All she wants is a kid. And, and it doesn't just seem impossible. It actually is impossible at her age. She can't. And two, this follows from Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is a suffering servant. Right after the suffering servant. You see, this, this verse, this utterance from Isaiah that Paul picks up is remarkable for those two ways, for those two aspects. Paul experiences birth pangs in verse 19 because he wants to produce Christ in them. Something that seems impossible. How can he put Christ in unrighteous, sinful people? Sarah's barrenness and child of the promise from verses 22 to 26 seems impossible. How can the Lord put a child in her? And then she cries to rejoice. The Lord has put a child in me. So Paul only pulls from Isaiah 40 to 53 up to this point. He doesn't quote anything after Isaiah 53. And then he does 
after Galatians 4. The suffering servant actually did something. He was actually birthed. And it leads to a cry of joy. And at the end of Galatians 4, and in Isaiah 54, that starts basically new creation language. Isaiah 54 to 66 is basically all new creation. It only follows after the suffering servant did something. He actually suffered, took upon iniquity, and it introduced us into this new creation. Isaiah 52 to 53, they're basically all anguish. Death, sin, and it ends with Isaiah 53, 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and numbered and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet, he bore the sins of many. He bore the sins of many. And makes intercession for the transgressors. Leading to the ne very next verse. Sing, O barren one who did not bear. In Isaiah 53, the servant bears sin so the woman could bear the promise. So years of pain, of barrenness, of wondering, what if nothing happens? The promise is given 20 plus years before the promise is actually fulfilled. I think we feel this a lot. Lord, I know what you say is true. I know your promise is sure. And while you may not grant all my heart's desires, I can trust you. And this, remember, is not placed on Sarah's faith. Because she messes up after this again. And so does Abraham. Messes up in Genesis 18, Genesis 22, Genesis 23, Genesis 24, Genesis 25. Four times after his covenant making ceremony. She gives Hagar to Abraham basically in the same way that Eve gave Adam the apple. Eve gave Adam the fruit. They want to bring on their own promise. And yet God is still faithful to bring about his promise. And so we feel this. We feel with Sarah. Lord, you've promised. I'm still waiting. I'm not sure when this is going to come out. Sometimes I wonder if it's going to come out. And Paul's, Paul's using this to show us this is our heavenly inheritance. Though we, we may not see it, we may not know it, we may not experience it all the time, it is there. And God's faithfulness is the bedrock we need to remind ourselves that this royal privilege, our status in the promise of his son, that we are his offspring and we shared his benefits. So these are the last points, the freedom you need. So Paul turns from Sarah to Hagar to you in verse 28. Because of the servant, remember, Isaiah 54 follows Isaiah 53, the suffering servants. This cry of rejoicing follows a cry of anguish. Because the servant bore your sins, you were now born of the promise. You were a son or a daughter of his work, placed in his family. If this depended on your work, your faithfulness, much as it depended on Abraham, Sarah, or Hagar, we would not achieve this status. And we need this bedrock. We need this assurance to get through our life. We, we know our indwelling sin. And we see these persecutions that come from outside of us. Like, Lord, how long is it going to be until you fulfill your promise to us? We see the seed of the flesh still persecuting the seed of the promise. Has us questioning our status. So Christianity, if you haven't yet figured out, is not a religion you want if you don't want hardship. If you don't want persecution, if you don't want a risk-free life. If you want those things. And as much as we long for risk-free, hardship-free, persecution-free life, 
Paul says it's actually not what we need. But Christianity actually, it, if it does nothing else, it builds resilience. It actually builds you through trial. Abraham and Sarah got through 20 plus years of, Lord, when's the promise coming? And taking on themselves their own promise. Gives us through hardship, through pain, and, and not by downplaying these things. It's not by, oh, this doesn't exist, or think happy thoughts. It's actually by enduring pain. That's how we get stronger. Christ was tempted and tried to the highest possible level, past anything we will ever know. Because we tend to buckle at the very first instance. Christ doesn't buckle. He, he feels the weight of sin to its very end. And he does that so that the patriarchs, Abraham being one of those, their wives, Sarah, prophets, priests throughout the Old Testament, apostles in the New Testament, and Christians throughout the centuries, including you, he does this so that we can endure it. Because we, we don't get anything close to what Christ got. And verse 30 actually is, is actually told by Sarah. She's the one who is quoted from in verse 30. So it plays double duty with Paul. Ishmael mocks Isaac in Genesis 21. The word used there is usually mocks or laughs at. And so to banish, they have to banish the threat to the covenant line. The covenant comes through Sarah and Isaac, and so they have to push them out. You're going to mix up the seed. And we need the seed to continue. So Paul, by bringing out the slime, by implication, he actually tells the Galatians to do the same thing. What Sarah did, you must do. And not by killing, not by pushing out in the evil sense, but it's, it's by doing this, by implication, the Judaizers, the, the circumcisers who have come in, in their midst, must be banished. They're the ones who are questioning our status. They have threatened their freedom and the promise. The community of those who have been purchased by Christ. So they must be cast out to preserve unity. Not the fight, it's to provide unity. So brothers and sisters in Christ, know that you too, as Paul says, you are a children of the promise. You are a child of the promise. You are a royal inheritor of a, of a heavenly kingdom. This, this is yours. You are inheritors with Christ in the kingdom of God. And unlike the royals, that can't be stripped of you. You can't lose your status as a, as a kingdom child. So how through this should we live? You're probably thinking this last week, or this last month, maybe a year, or you actually can't remember a time that you haven't been burned by sin, by persecution, by things outside of your control. And you start wondering, with all this stuff that's, that's happening around me, am I actually a child of the seed? Because surely this wouldn't happen to me if I was. Or maybe you're not sure what it's like to have a faithful father or mother. And so this, this parental relationship with God, it seems suspect. Are you sure he's a good father? Or you just can't imagine, what actually does this do for me? What, actually, what does this life give me? This promised status, this heavenly citizenship, citizenship assures you that Jesus will never loosen his grip of you. Doesn't look at your performance and say, well, this one isn't, isn't up to snuff. Doesn't look like a royal heir. heir. Doesn't look like a kid of my kingdom. He doesn't loosen his grip. But the, the God the Father invites you and his family with bonds that transcend death. Actually get stronger with death. So you must hear, as Paul says, the law telling you you have fallen under the curse of God because of your sin and shunned from his family. But trust in the gospel. It's Paul pleads with you and I plead with you. 
to be inserted back into the family. Not by a different God, but by the very same God. Through the work of his promised son, the suffering servant that Paul talks about, that gives us this new child promise. Who bears the promise by taking, bearing the curse. Gives you his spirits, and then gives you full access to this new royal family that you are now in. And that royal family will never end. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you've done this for us, that you've you both prayed for us, you've borne the sins that we should have, you've inserted us into a family that will never cease, a family that, that takes us in, gives us a new identity, and we will always be children of this promise. And it's because of the work of your son. We thank you and we praise you all this in your son's name. Amen.